Bingo, we're back. <laughs> 12 o'clock rock. I'm Jay Fidel. Today is a really interesting day, and it may be in the Chinese sense too, um, because we have two tsunamis maybe coming at us. Because we have rain downtown. We have our party at 5 o'clock at the uh, at the Laniakea YWCA. And also we have a show today about the Y, the, what is it? Armed Services, Services YMCA. YMCA. Okay, and we're going to distinguish that from the YWCA, which we should do. And we're going to, you know, talk about the history of it. And we have two people. One, uh, Lori Moore, she's the Executive Director of the Armed Services y, y, w, YMCA. There you go. And uh, we have Faith Carabas, and she is, what's your title over there? Outreach Director. Outreach Director, I'm writing it down. Okay, so we know what your respective areas are. Okay, so Lori, can you tell us about the why and what's important about the why? What's the news, I should say, the armed, pers armed forces why? What's the news about the why? So the Armed Services YMCA, uh, we've been in Hawaii almost 100 years now. So you, don't, you don't look anything close to that. Isn't it? I, I know, thank you. I have aged very, very well. You must love your work. <laughs> I do love my work. I always say I have the best job anywhere. Okay, okay. So I guess it shows. <laughs> I think so. Yes, thank you. So in 2017, we will be here 100 years in Hawaii, which we think is amazing. So that is the longest serving organization for Hawaii's military. Um, and this last year, in 2015, we served over 44,110 service people and their families, which is very substantial. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of folks. Mm -hmm. We have a fairly small staff, but we're doing great things and providing some great programs and services that really enhance their life in the military. It's important to do that. You it know, is important because they're to serving do that. the country. Often they risk their lives or give their lives for the country. We need to. We need to support them, respect them, and love them. That's yeah. right. Yeah. And we're honored to be able to do that. Yeah. I would be okay. too. Yeah. Good for you guys. Thank you. Thank you. So what does outreach mean? Um, I tell people about the great things that the Armed Services YMCA does. I let our military families know what we do. Uh, many people don't know about some of our programs. I also oversee um, what I think is the best program, I'm sure Lori says they're all the best programs, but I oversee Operation Kid Comfort, uh, which is a program that is supported by um, our many local people in the community, uh, the Hawaiian Quilt Guild. Uh, we have volunteers from there that create handcrafted, personalized quilts um, with pictures of deployed parents for children who's, who are experiencing um, sadness because their parents are deployed. So we. We do quilts and we also do pillowcases for them. How are you guys funded? To it's generous donors like you. <laughs> <laughs> From the public. Absolutely. Yes. We do not receive any federal or state funding. So it's all individuals who contribute, foundations, corporations. So okay. we're, we're very fortunate to have a, a good cadre of, of supporters. Well, I'm sure you have a lot of people who want to, you know, follow what I was talking about, That's namely right. to support our people in uniform. That's right. So what's the 100th anniversary? Are you going to do something special for it? Yeah, we've got a couple things planned. Um, we'd like to work with some partners and do some real special things probably in the spring. I can't divulge all the details okay. quite yet, okay. uh, but at bases across the island. So we have sites, um, 10 different sites across Oahu, and three of our main sites at Joint Base Pearl Harbor Hickam, Marine Corps Base Hawaii, and at Wheeler Schofield, and we expect to have some pretty large parties, shall we say, at those locations. <laughs> so what, what are we talking about? We're talking about the YMCA, um, you know, and especially the Armed Forces, Armed Services YMCA. Yeah. What comes to mind is that is that building on, was it Hotel and Richards, yeah. is it? It's uh, now the, the Art Museum was no, the Hemeter Building. it was an Art building. Museum, before yeah. that was the Hemeter Building. Right. Before that, it was, uh, you know, the... Uh, the YMCA, which I remember when I first came here, it was a pretty active place. Right. So kind of an interesting story there because um, a group of, of folks here in Hawaii, local folks, Lauren Thurston and, and Dillingham, got together, purchased the original Royal Hawaiian Hotel, and opened it as what we were known as the Army Navy YMCA at that time in 1917. That building? Mm -hmm. Well, it was the original Royal Hawaiian. That yes. was the original yes. Royal Hawaiian? Yes, it was. 
Then oh, move to what is God, now. God, you heard it here on Think Tech. <laughs> <laughs> then move to what is now, you know, the art museum. And um, during that time, in fact, I can tell you a really fun story that kind of relates to yesterday's events. During that time, it was so popular with uh, the World War II era servicemen that they had 20,000 people come through through the course of the weekend. So they were very, very busy, and so busy, in fact, that with as many rooms and cots and dorms that they had, they would still have to add beds to the gym in order to you know, have a place for everyone to stay. Because when those guys wanted to get away, that was the place to this go. This was R&R. Exactly. That's what right. you provided, you That's know, right. right on through a couple That's of right. world wars. Yeah. And, you know, uh, Sterling Kale, who is a Pearl Harbor survivor you can meet down at the Arizona Memorial Visitor Center. He's down there several times a week. He still talks about his time at the Armed Services YMCA downtown. He must be in his 90s. Yeah, uh, he is. I want to say he's 97. Okay. Well, Actually, he, he just had a birthday like two weeks ago. <laughs> That's news. <laughs> yes, it is big news. Faith, um, you wanted to say something? Oh, I just was just going to say the Royal Hawaiian Hotel. It was the original Royal Hawaiian Hotel. And I actually think that they tore the Royal Hawaiian Hotel they down did. because of termites and all they that did. other stuff. Yep. But we have, we have a great okay. photo. Uh, you were talking about them sleeping. We have a great photo yeah. of them sleeping actually on the lanai of the old Royal Hawaiian Hotel even during the 20s. It was so yeah. popular then, yeah. too. Yeah. Yeah. And it was popular during Vietnam, too. Mm -hmm. um, I remember it was, it, was a, right. it was a hub of activity. And uh, servicemen who wanted to get away from their, you know, their units and had, right. had some leave, they would go there, and that would give them an opportunity to enjoy Hotel Street. <laughs> exactly. Right. <laughs> and, and the rest of the city. I mean, it was off the bases, yeah. So the other thing that we're doing for the 100 years is gathering stories. So all of your listeners out there, if they have any stories of their experience with the Armed Services YMCA or the Army Navy YMCA, as um, it was called formally, We'd love to hear about it. We have a lot of stories from 1920s, 1930s, 1940s, mm. um, 1970s, but we're missing some from the 50s and 60s. Mm -hmm. And we'd love to hear from people and their experiences. Uh, and we would with too. Them. So if you yeah. find people like that, you want to, you know, provide okay. a historical legacy. Let us know with yeah. them right here on the show. We'd love that. Very important, you know, because they're getting older. We're going to lose them. Yeah. We want to catch them before they go. Well, thank you. So historically, now 100 years, um, it was a hub. And there were other uh, YMCA's mm -hmm. in town, but this mm -hmm. was the only, you know, like in the civilian community, the only armed services YMCA, right? That's correct. That's correct. And th that meant that it was, it was reserved for military people? It was. And, you know, most other YMCA's uh, operate off a membership program. But for the armed services YMCA, as long as you were military, you were a member. And there were no dues to be paid. It was just, come, let us take care of you. Let us offer you this place of refuge. Let us help you write a letter home. Mm -hmm. um, you know, get a hot dog, a bed, uh, a blanket, and a coat for 50 cents a so night. What's yeah. the difference between that and the USO? So interestingly, the Armed Services YMCA became the USO. So USO was United Services Organization, six different organizations that came together during that World War II period of time. And the Armed Services Y was one of those organizations that joined with Catholic Charities and Traveler's Aid and others uh, to form the USO. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. So can you give me the, uh, the depth and breadth of all your units now, so to speak, on all the bases? What have you got out there? So we're busy. Um, like I said, we've got our three main branches, and I mentioned those. We've also got Ali Amanu Military Reservation, which is right in housing over in the Salt Lake area. And that actually, it used to be Coast Guard housing, then it became Army, but now you'll find just about every branch of service living there, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, we also operate out of Tripler and Schofield Medical Clinic as well. And, and those particular units, we have a children's waiting room. So families can go that are receiving medical treatment or perhaps uh, one of their children is receiving medical treatment. They can drop off the well child. The well child can be well cared for and have a lot of fun while mom or dad or you know siblings at a medical appointment. Because what you see at like Tripler and Schofield mm -hmm. is you can't always take your child with you. 
Um, if you're an adult and you have a lab uh, appointment, any hospital, yeah. Yeah, you've got to find care. And what happens is, you know, people move here, they come from the mainland, right. they don't necessarily have the support system in place. Yeah. You know, they don't have the family here to back them up, they don't have, perhaps they just moved, they haven't made close friends yet. And so that's an area where we can help. And, and of course, Tripler and, and Schofield love it because they've seen a 33% increase in the number of medical appointments that are actually attended. Mm -hmm. You know, people don't miss their medical appointment because they can't find child care. So what I'm getting out of this is that your organization, the Armed Services YMCA, offers help in various ways. So many. It's not limited to a, a single thing or recipe. It's like what, whatever needs to happen, you make it happen. That's right. I mean, well, within we work, your means, I expect. No, you're exactly, <laughs> yes. You're right. We work with um, the local commands and we fill in gaps because a lot of the military, you know, provide services. So MWR and others will provide services, but there's some things they don't do and they can't do. And that's where we can work with commands and we step in and do it. So the, the YMCA, the Armed Services YMCA as a whole has a set of core programs, but then each individual area is allowed to do, you know, what is necessary for their local community. Yeah. So. And on that note, local community, the operative mm -hmm. word, if you look back, correct me if I'm wrong, but if you look back historically, the, the Armed Services YMCA in, in Hawaii, in Honolulu, as I knew it, was not just a little island of military people. It was um, a place for exchange. It was mm -hmm. a place where the public was invited, um, right. where people could come and meet. I mean, I'm sure there were dances, you know, a la, mm -hmm. uh, 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 what do you call it? Um, the, um, um, that organization we talked about a minute ago, the, uh, the USO. USO. Yeah. Um, it was a place where the, uh, the, the soldiers and sailors could meet people from the community. Mm -hmm. It was a place where the community could come and meet people, you know, and a la a restaurant, something like that, or some kind of economic, you know, transactional thing. So it wasn't just reserved, it wasn't locked up just for the military. It was a place in the community, like the one on Richard Street, where people could, you know, meet mm. each other. Um, and I and I and I'm concerned that what you're doing is all on the basis. So have we lost that with the loss of the um, of the unit on um, Richard Street? No, no, we haven't lost that. I think that the local community still cares about um, military families who we serve, and we still care about the local community, and we make. Um, we help facilitate some of those transactions. We have local volunteers who will come in and care. Um, for example, with Operation Key Comfort, about our kids, they they um, tell their neighbors about a program. Actually, how Operation Kid Comfort got started in Hawaii was a local volunteer found out about it through her friend. Um, she began it. She actually brought the program to um, to our attention, and we were on Joint Base Pearl Harbor Hickam, but that didn't that did not stop her from saying, "Hey, you know, I know that I'm making these quilts for, um, for actually at the time for children outside of Hawaii. I know there's tons of military around here. I would really like to do something for Hawaii's military children." So she made that happen. She um, told me a story about how her next door neighbor um, across the bay. Um, was really interested in what she was doing and donated. She was actually a, a local artist who had a, a second home here. She donated a lot of her um, fabrics that had used her artwork to us so that we could make quilts with that fabric. Um, and, and that's, I think, the, the care and concern that the local community has shown has been steadfast throughout those hundred years. One of my favorite stories is from World War II. Um, when the bombing occurred, um, the army called us up and said hey we need to find shelter for many of the families that need to be evacuated from the various bases that have been bombed C can you do it and of course we can do it we opened up our, all of our facilities but we ran out of room as well and it was the local community who said hey we'll so open up our beds it's a sort of a backup system mm -hmm. a connection and what could be more appropriate now with uh, the 75th anniversary of yeah, pearl right. harbor when i Imagine that the one on Richard Street was really busy. It was stuff. busy. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to take a, a short special. break, you guys. We're going to come back. I want to talk about you know the future of the Armed Services YMCA uh, and how it plays with today's military Perfect. and tomorrow's military. Okay. Uh, we'll be right back. Aloha Kako. I'm Marcia Joyner, inviting you to navigate the journey with us. We are here every Wednesday morning at 11 a.m. 
and we really want you to be with us where we look at the options and choices of end-of-life care. Aloha. Hi, I'm Kili'i Akina, president of the Grassroot Institute. I'd love you to join us every week, Mondays at 2 o'clock p.m. for Ehana Kako. Let's work together. We report every week on the good things going on in our state as well as the better things that can go on in the future. We have guests covering everything from the economy, the government, and society. See you Mondays on Ehana Kako at 2 o'clock p.m. Until then, I'm Kili'i Akina. Aloha. We're back, and we have uh, Lori Moore. She's the executive director of the Armed Services YMCA in Hawaii, and Faith Carbus. She's the uh, outreach director of the Armed Services YMCA in Hawaii. So, uh, yeah, so you were talking during the break about different programs and how you were, mm, you know, dealing with um, the, the current uh, configuration of troops here. So what is it like? Talk about it. Well, you know, one of the things that really concerns families these days, and, and studies literally just came out today and, and showed that, um, both spouses and military members are very concerned about the effect of deployment on their children. And Legitimate concern. Yes. Deployment can be months and months, yeah. Absolutely. And 37% of those surveyed said that was a huge concern for them. And how they dealt with that was very, very important. And we all know that the children are affected by that. You know, when mom or dad leaves for six, seven, eight, nine, ten months at a time, that's tough. That's tough on everybody. And so some of our programs address that. And we talked a little bit about the Operation Kid Comfort program and that offers some comfort to, to younger children. But I think to address some of the issues that older children have, we've got a program that's called um, Operation Hero. And that children is specifically for elementary age kids. And we divide it up appropriately age-wise. But what we found with some of these kids that are perhaps experiencing difficulty due to you know mom or dad being deployed is that they're exhibiting social issues as well as academic. And so this program addresses both. It's a free program. We run it through our elementary schools um, across the island. And it helps these kids, A, with homework help, right, and a little bit of, you know, one-on-one -on -one tutoring, as well we as... We provide that. We do. As well as, you know, hey, I'm, I'm feeling really anxious about mom or dad being gone. How do I deal with that? How can I address that? And we give them skills to do that. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it's self-esteem, you mm -hmm. know, really just building their self-esteem and, and reminding them that, hey, this is what mom or dad does. These are kind of the aspects of their job. For the most part, they're safe. You are loved and you are well taken care of by the people that are here. So you're going to fill the gaps, so to speak, in their lives and families. But, you know, when I was in the service, and we're talking, we're talking 40, Yesterday. 40, 50 years ago, <laughs> um, you know, the, the average enlisted, and a lot of the junior officers, they didn't have two farthings to rub together. That's right. They were not well paid. That's right. Um, and, they, you know, as a result, you, you wouldn't call them middle class. You, you'd call them struggling. Mm -hmm. um, and their families, obviously, were struggling. Mm -hmm. And as soon as they got married, the struggle became clear. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if uh, we are still talking about the same thing or it's different. I know they're paid more now, and they get benefits maybe that are a little richer now. Um, but I'm wondering if, you know, part of what you do is really a social safety net for people in uniform because they don't have enough money to be middle class and you know take care of themselves. I mean, can you talk about that? Absolutely. So we operate food banks basically at all of our branches because we know that sometimes our military end up in a tough spot financially for whatever the reason may be. So they can come to us and they can get, you know, a great meal and you know, Faith can tell you a really mm -hmm. touching story, I think, that we had recently come up. Because there are organizations that do that besides us. But some on base have very, very strict guidelines as to it has to be reported to the command. It has to be for this reason. We can be a little bit more broad in scope when we provide services. And this is an example we've recently came about, and it's, it's quite touching. Well, I can hardly wait. Tell us the so story. We had a young Marine come into our um, office on Kaneohe. Marine Corps Base Hawaii, and um, she was pregnant with her first child. She, you know, um, is diligent, hardworking, 
like any Marine, I, um, we, we love our Marines, especially because Lori's a wife of a Marine. So, uh, okay. yeah, so Marines are very special to us. Um, anyway, so this young Marine came in pregnant, uh, hardworking, and she had two other children with her, and she told us that she um, had recently taken custody of her um, niece and nephew because her brother had um, just suddenly passed away. So she, she was not prepared to take care of um, her young niece and nephew, but like any good U.S. service person, she, she stepped up and said, I'll do it, I'll take care of them. Um, it just it took a while for the process um, to go through the courts for her to, to get custody, to get, for her to get the insurance, oh, all that sort of so stuff. So hard on people. So just boom, she has this huge uh, responsibility but we were able to set her up with groceries, but also um, diapers for her baby that would soon be born, um, gas cards, commissary cards for anything else that she needed, and, and basically said, if you need anything else, come back. You um, become the couldn't. social safety net, um, you know, parallel to what's happening outside, where the state or the city provides right. a social, you provide a social safety net of sorts. Yeah, yeah and I think it's more than just, um, I mean, I would hate to use the, I don't want to say social safety net, I'd rather say we really become their family because many of these service members sure. leave their family. So um, it's, it's not just giving somebody a gift card or groceries and saying, hey, thank you so much, um, we'll see you later. It's, um, I'll give you a call tomorrow and see, see how yeah. you're doing, or hey, I, yeah. I know somebody that can help you. So, you know, this, this all raises the issue of um, outreach, if you will, but it's, I wouldn't call it outreach for this. <clears throat> it's more like inreach. Mm -hmm. So you have, a, you have, I don't know how many, well, there are 100,000 people here in the military right now. 300,000 um, 300. um, dependents and military okay, uh, okay. service persons. Uh, mm -hmm. Fine. 300,000. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying, we have quite a few. <laughs> children, men, women, children, yeah. all that. Um, and, uh, you know, you have to, if you're going to be effective, you have to reach them. Mm -hmm. You have to let them know you're here, mm -hmm. uh, which they may or may not know about. Mm -hmm. um, now, that's, that's a burden, at least, as more, at least as difficult as doing outreach outside, you know, the military mm -hmm. and the bases. What do you do in order to make sure that all these people in, in uniform and dependents uh, know about your services? What do you do? Well, I think the... the beauty of what we do, obviously we reach out um, to our spouse clubs and, and to local commands and, and to um, other organizations, but when you form those deep bonds with people, they end up being the outreach for you as well. So many people that I've spoken with and I said, hey, how did you hear about us? Oh, I heard about you from my neighbor or heard about you from somebody that um, I met at the playground or um, Actually, we have a, a preschool family that came through. She found out about us because her sister is stationed here. So if you service people well, if you become not their social safety net, mm -hmm. but, but their family safety net, um, they're going to share with their neighbors, Word with their friends. Yeah. yeah. Um, of course, we, we do go out and we do um, outreach. but What is that? Teaching? Um, lectures? Um, we go out and we meet with um, various spouse groups. That could be officer spouse groups. Do you ask spouse the command groups. to help you? Well, I was going to say we also go to in newcomer briefings. So each newcomer briefing, we make sure to let people know we're available. So you're part of that process. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. One other thing is, <clears throat> you know, in years past, I was a director of the Coast Guard Foundation because I'm Coast oh, Guard. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, not Marines, Coast Guard. That's all right. I like them. <laughs> we okay. love the Coast Guard, too. We love the Coast Guard, too. <laughs> and what they did is they took care of the families. Of, just as you mentioned, uh, you know, when they went out in deployment, when the service member went out in deployment, they took care of the families, uh, you know, the wife usually, who stayed at home with the kids. And, and uh, you know, that was stressful. And sure. their spouse wasn't around. And the Coast Guard Foundation would, would help them out, mm -hmm. sort of like what you're mm -hmm. talking about. Mm -hmm. And it raises the question in my mind is that there are probably a number of other organizations that do the same kinds of things mm -hmm. for different niches, you know, within the military establishment right. here. And uh, I'd like to know how you deal with them, if you deal with them, and how you collaborate with them. Yeah, so we do partner with anybody and everybody, quite frankly, because we believe in the strength of partnerships. And our goal is just to meet the needs of our military. You know, our egos are not wrapped up in this at all. Uh, we have a job to do, and, and if, if we do it well by partnering with someone that's what we want to do mm -hmm. so for example navy marine corps relief they do some similar things in terms of financial assistance as as to what we do but again they have um i would say stricter guidelines 
into what they can and cannot do and it's more direct support to family so for instance this uh, marine that we spoke about she couldn't we were her only option for assistance in that case because of some of the guidelines that they have to adhere to so we're a little bit again filling in a gap yeah. right you know uh, we have a new almost a new president um, he has different views about many things mm -hmm. um, including military you know uh, military bases and assignments around various places in the world I think uh, and the world's changing more yes. and and the way the military works is changing yes it's no longer the you know the, the greatest generation kind of experience it's different now it's high-tech uh, maybe fewer people doing more leveraged jobs uh, traveling quicker and being um, very mobile and all right. that and uh, of course diplomacy changes international relations change um, how can you change to meet that how can you change how are you what's the plan to keep up with what i consider a very fast moving world a very fast moving military i think when you have deep relationships like we do with all the military commands and with our our families um keeping up with the changes is simply listening to what they need and then following through and doing that so if they if they need to if we need to tweak a program in order to meet a need in order to fill in a gap we're going to do that. I think we have um, the staff and the community support that allows us to be flexible and, and change as we need to change with the military. Yeah, I think you occupy a very interesting spot in the sense that in Hawaii, I'm sure you know, people are not close to the military. They, you know, they remember the Massey case right. back in the 30s. Right. Uh, you know, although the military has been here for more than 150 years the american military you know has been here for more than 150 years i think there's a lot of you know we had a program about the military in hawaii a couple of years ago at, at the lani akea down mm -hmm. the block and there were protesters outside what are they protesting well they're protesting in the military sure so and, and go home kind of thing you know and uh, that's a great concern to me and it sounds like you know you are a connection you help the you know local people people in Hawaii, civilian people have nothing to do, any aspect of the military presence here. You help them understand what's going on. Uh, and I think that's very important. It is important. And we feel that, you know, these people are making routine sacrifices on a daily basis. And for our community to understand that makes all the difference in the world. And also for our community to understand the economic difference that the military makes for our yeah. state. So talk know? to them. Talk to them now. Um, talk to them, Lori. That, see that camera with the red light? <laughs> Do you see that talk, camera talk with the them. red light? <laughs> Tell them what they should be thinking and doing about, you know, the Armed Services YMCA and about the military, uh, you know, presence establishment here, here in Hawaii. Well, we're fortunate to have the heroes that we have. We're fortunate to have the heroes representing us, fighting for our freedoms, you know, taking care of us as a nation. And I am the spouse of a retired Marine. I'm also the mother of a, a student at one of our service academies. So. I do think being a mother of um, a, a service member is probably more difficult than being a spouse. And I ask for your support for my family, for other families, and for all of those that, that sacrifice for us. And, um, and you Faith, know. Faith Carabas, how much of that do you agree with? Um, well, I agree with Lori. <laughs> I, I think in some <laughs> cases I disagree with you. <laughs> Because I think um, many of the Hawaiians that I've met or the citizens of Hawaii are, are supportive of our military. Um, I have a wonderful story. My um, father was stationed here um, as a young child with his family, so my grandfather was stationed here. And um, they made great friends with the local family in Nanakuli. And I actually have an appointment to meet with um, the daughter. So a very young child, um, back in the 60s. I'm going to meet with her. Her son also graduated. Yours hasn't yet, but one from one of the service academies. And um, there are actually deep roots, I think, with the Hawaiian people in the military. I agree, and I wouldn't suggest otherwise. Yeah. You, do, you do great Just work, so you guys. Know. It's a yeah. great organization. <laughs> Thank you for coming on our show. Thank you, Thank Jay. You. Very much. I appreciate so, it. Uh, Aloha. Aloha.